Hello, welcome to this webinar on raising sheep and goats for profit. This hour-long webinar is presented by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, or NCAT, a nonprofit organization with offices across the United States. My name is Jeff Berkby. I'm Outreach Director for one of NCAT's major programs, the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, also called ATRA, A-T-T-R-A. NCAT has managed ATRA for more than 20 years with funding provided by the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture. Through ATRA, we provide extensive information on how to farm more sustainably, including information on crops, livestock, organic certification, farm energy, and many other topics. You can visit our ATRA website at www.atra.ncat.org. That's attra.ncat.org. Now, a bit of housekeeping for this hour-long webinar. You'll see a comment or chat box online in the right-hand side of your screen. And during the webinar, you can type in questions that we can ask of our livestock specialists after they're done with our presentations. So feel free, if you're not clear on any topic, to type in your questions. Um, I'll be choosing questions that we can ask of our presenters during the last 10 minutes or so of the webinar. If we don't get to all of your questions, feel free to go to our ATRA website after the webinar um, and you can type in a question there and ask our online experts, or you can call our toll-free hotline, and the number will be on the screen as well as our website, too. And you could talk at, at your leisure about sheep and goat issues with the staff after the webinar. And now on to our webinar on sheep and goats and what they can do for your farming operation. We have two sheep and goat experts with us today to present the webinar. I'd first like to introduce Linda Coffey, who is a livestock specialist with NCAT, and is based on our NCAT office in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Linda has a bachelor's and master's degree in animal science from the University of Missouri, and has lectured and written extensively on sheep and goat production and marketing. Linda and her family also operate a small farm producing and marketing sheep, dairy goats, pigs, and chickens. Linda, welcome to the webinar. Thanks, Jeff. With us also is Margot Hale, and Margot is, a, is the Southeast Regional Office Director for NCAT also based in our Fayetteville, Arkansas office. Margot has a bachelor's degree in animal science and a master's degree in agriculture and extension, ed, extension education, both from the University of Arkansas. Margot also researches and answers farmer questions about sheep, goats, and dairy cattle, and she and her husband manage a small farm outside of Fayetteville, Arkansas, raising vegetables and livestock. Margot, I'll turn it over to you to start the webinar, and you and uh, Linda can then interact and lead us through the world of sheep and goats and raising them for profit. All right. Thanks, Jeff, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're really excited to get to share with you a little bit today about sheep and goats. This webinar is being recorded, and we posted on the ACTRA website, which is listed here. So in a few days, please look for it on the ACTRA website under a webinar link, and that way you can listen to it again and get all the resources we mentioned and also share it with others. So today we want to start this by, uh, as we mentioned, Margo and I both have farms with sheep and goats, and we want you to think about your farm and about whole farm planning. We'd like you to think about your resources, your farm goals, what are your enterprises currently, and then think about how sheep or goats might help you to reach your goals or solve some problems. For example, could you use more income or better cash flow? Do you need an animal to harvest some unused forage or to clean up weeds or brush? Do you need more products for your customers or uh, more draw to your farm business. Sheep and goats can do all of that for you and they can do a whole lot more. So with that said, keep your farm in mind as we discuss some of the reasons you might consider adding sheep or goats. Margo? So today we're going to talk a little bit about why you might want sheep or goats or why you would want to add them to your farm. Sheep and goats have many benefits and many appealing characteristics. Today in this presentation, we will cover some of these benefits and discuss how they might add value to your farm. One of the things I've always appreciated about sheep and goats is their small size. And as a small girl growing up in Missouri on a livestock farm, wasn't really involved in the business much. I was scared of the cattle and I didn't like the hogs. 
But then my family brought sheep back to the farm to clean up weeds and mow around the outbuildings, and they had immediate appeal for me. So I went from very little interest in livestock to taking full responsibility because I was not intimidated by these animals. And I find that if children are part of your farm, sheep or goats are a great way to get them involved with livestock. In addition to your family, the goats and sheep are a draw for visitors, as I said, um, but besides their ch charming aspects and being easy, easy to handle, that small size means they fit on acreages where cattle maybe wouldn't be practical. They are inexpensive to buy and to feed, and they raise quite well on forages, and they're easy to haul and easy to sell direct because they produce a manageable quantity of meat. It's easy to sell a whole lamb or a whole goat and most everybody has the freezer space to store a whole animal. So in a, in a word I guess I would say their small size makes them very manageable. In addition to their small size, another great benefit of sheep and goats is that they're very prolific and productive. To explain this a little better, Think about starting with a ewe. You purchase a ewe and breed her. Within five months, she will lamb, and hopefully she'll have twins and possibly even triplets or even quadruplets. Within a few months, you can wean those lambs. And because she's weaning probably two lambs, that means the ewe is weaning almost her weight in pounds. Um, this is really impressive if you think about compared to cattle, for instance, where a cow would not wean her weight in, in, um, in her offspring. But that is possible with sheep and goats. So in less than a year of purchasing a ewe, you can have products to sell for wean lambs. So that makes for a quick return on investment because of their quick growth and maturity and the fact that they reproduce so well. And um, that, so it really helps you to get a sellable product very quickly. And also, these characteristics help you to build your flock quickly. You can start with just a few animals, and within a year or two, you can double or triple your herd or flock size. So it makes it a great way and a very economical way to quickly grow your herd. As Margot said, you have a saleable product very quickly, and there is a good demand for these products. Although it may take some effort to find your initial customers, the increasing ethnic population in our country means there is much better demand for lamb and, for, and particularly for goat meat than there were than there was in years previous. And we're importing a great deal of meat that we could be producing here. Fleece is another option, although on the commodity market it's not very profitable. If you can sell direct to hand spinners or uh, process into finished garments or into yarn, you can have a good market for the wool. Uh, a lot of people appreciate natural fibers. And many people who can't drink goat's milk, or can't drink cow's milk rather, do enjoy goat's milk. And so you can find a good market for the milk in it and for the cheese from goats and from cheese as well from sheep. So besides just having actual products you can sell, sheep and goats offer many other benefits to your operation. And one of those is the benefits that they get from pasture and provide to your pastures. They can turn your pastures and your forages into money without equipment. What I mean by this is that they're harvesting their forages and you don't have to have equipment to put up hay. You can see these sheep here are grazing and are doing a good job of harvesting that forage and then turning it into meat and fiber. And they do that very efficiently. You can also use sheep and goats to improve pastures by eating weeds and brush. You can see this photo on the right is a great depiction of this. These farmers wanted to clear up their um, heavily wooded brushy land so they could run cattle. You can see this fence line contrast is really remarkable. The area on the right, which started out as wonderful goat feed, very brushy and briars and lots of goodies in there for them to eat, put some goats on there and they've cleaned it out. And so the farmers met their goals in that they were able to turn their pastures into more cattle friendly pastures. And also, sheep and goats add fertility to your land, to your pastures, through the addition of their manure. 
Another thing we appreciate about sheep and goats is how adaptable they are. They fit on a, such a diverse range of farms from large extensive uh, range operations to small more intensive places and they improve pastures and add fertility to all kinds of different farms in different climates, different topography, and different kinds of forages. They complement cattle and horse farms and vegetable and uh, fruit farms as well because they can use forages that aren't currently being used. So really appreciate their adaptability. Right, and building on that adaptability, not only do they fit in all areas of the country and all different types of farms, they also adapt well to many different grazing situations, whether it be lots of grassy pastures or very brushy, brushy areas. Sheep and goats can really fit in a variety of different situations. Here you see sheep grazing under a power line um, that may normally need to be mowed with equipment or sprayed with herbicides, but sheep clear that alleyway just, just wonderfully. Sheep grazing in a walnut orchard. Many orchard and vineyard operators use sheep and goats to keep weeds and tall grasses down in the alleyways and also to pick up dropped fruit. Sheep and goats have also been used extensively to control noxious weeds and invasive plants. Here you see some goats eating kudzu. And in the southeast, kudzu is a, a big problem, takes over a lot of land, but goats do a good job of controlling it and actually killing it out. And there are many examples all across the country of sheep and goats being used to control various noxious weeds. So you can probably tell Margo and I really like sheep and goats, really appreciate the great benefits from these enterprises. But we also recognize there are challenges to raising sheep and goats. One of those is the learning curve. Uh, of 40 years ago, more people knew about sheep and goats than, than are currently have been producing. So finding local expertise might be a little trickier than it would have been back in the good old days. But you can check with your local extension office and get linked up with local producer groups. And that can be a tremendous help, and we highly recommend that. In addition, our ATRA publications can be very useful as you're starting out, and we can point you to resources. And we are here for you to call if you have a specific question. Another big issue is marketing. Although I told you there is great demand for the products, and that's true, the infrastructure for marketing may be difficult to find. You've got to check out in your area what access do you have to various kinds of markets and especially to processing if you intend to sell meat. You may have to find your customers, develop and grow the market and all of that takes time, takes energy. And of course you've got to check into local regulations. There's quite a bit of variation among states so you'll have to do some homework to find out what's allowed as far as marketing different products. Sheep and goats also face some production challenges. The first challenge you'll have to overcome is fencing. And I'm sure you have probably all heard all sorts of stories about how difficult it is to keep sheep and goats contained. They do require more extensive fencing than other livestock. So if you have existing fences for cattle, like a three-strand barbed wire fence, that will require modification in order to hold in sheep or goats. The good news is there are lots of options out there that are quite ad adequate and many of them can be economical. So there are solutions, but you'll definitely have to work on fencing before bringing sheep or goats to your farm. Another challenge you'll face is predation. Because of the small size of sheep and goats, they do face predation and this can range from coyotes to mountain lions to your neighborhood dogs. So really be aware that this will be a challenge, but once again, there are solutions. Good fencing, and then using a livestock guardian animal, such as a donkey, a llama, or more commonly used are various breeds of livestock guardian dogs. As far as health goes, probably the biggest health concern you'll face with sheep and goat production is internal parasites. And this is especially true if you live in a humid area. We'll provide you a little bit of information later on resources to help you learn more about managing internal parasites. But just be aware, this is something you'll need to learn about and be aware of as you raise sheep and goats. 
because of our time constraints today, we're not going to be able to go in any depth on production information, uh, although we will talk a little bit. But please see these ATRA publications for more information at our website. Uh, call attention to the Illustrated Guide to Sheep and Goat Production, which is particularly geared for beginners. And we have individual publications about various enterprises. The Small Ruminant Sustainability Check Sheet is a whole farm planning tool. And while it takes some time to work through, it can really help you to set your farm goals and work on priorities for your business. And the resource list that is attached to that or available separately will steer you to resources. We'll mention a few today, but, but there are many, many more that can be helpful in your business. And then please consult with your local cooperative extension office to get local information and whatever um, publications they may have available and especially to get connected with the sheep and goat producers in your area as a mentor is so important and visiting farms is so helpful. That's right. Visiting farms is so helpful and one of the things that visiting with other producers and visiting other farms will help you decide is if you want sheep or goats. So getting to visit with sheep and goat producers and get to handle animals before you get started is really a great thing to do. There's also some other things you should consider when deciding if you want sheep or goats. As Linda has mentioned, your farm goals are very important. You need to decide what you want to get from sheep or goats and what you want from them on your farm. Also consider your market. Do you have a, a local market in your area that is interested in buying lamb or goat meat? Do you have a hand spinners guild that is interested in fleeces? Those type of market decisions can help you decide if you should get sheep or goats. Also look at your forage base. If you have mainly grass pastures, sheep would probably be a better fit for your operation. But if your farm looks anything like mine and is hilly and wooded and rocky and has brush and briars, then goats would probably be a better fit. And of course, all of it comes down to your personal <laughs> preference. As I mentioned, getting to visit other operations and get your hands on some animals will really help you decide what type of animal you want to work with. Whichever animal you decide to work with, it's so important that you start with healthy animals. And if you don't know how to recognize a healthy animal, please take that mentor with you when you go shopping. And speaking of shopping, I don't recommend you go to your local sale barn. Even if the producer dropped off healthy animals that are good producers, which is, I would say, not real likely, they're going to pick up all kinds of bugs there, and perhaps foot rot, which you sure don't want to take home. And they're going to encounter a lot of stress much better option would be to visit a local farm where you can see the whole herd or the whole flock and assess the health and the management of that farm. You really want to buy an animal that's adapted to your conditions and your forages and your kind of management. If you expect a meat goat to come home and clear brush on your farm, you don't want to buy a show goat that's had his groceries brought to him twice a day all his life. So get an animal that's suited to the purpose that you want to uh, adapt to use them for, but please make sure they're healthy. That's right. So start with healthy stock. That really will make your operation go so much more smoothly from the start. But then you need to work to keep your animals healthy. And good nutrition really is the basis of keeping your animals healthy. Animals that are on a high plane of nutrition are much better able to withstand any sort of disease or stress that may come their way. Also practice good sanitation, that's kind of common sense, but keep barns and holding areas clean and dry, that will really help prevent the spread of disease. You need to be observant and watch your animals and really have your eyes on them every day. This will help you notice any animals that may be limping or may be lagging behind. Those are indications of problems that you need to respond to and get those animals treated and dealt with before the problem gets worse or it spreads to the rest of your herd or flock. Another good thing about observing your animals daily is you can count them and this will be an indicator of maybe you've had a predation problem and a couple of animals are missing and you need to get that problem stopped quickly 
or maybe your electric fence got turned off and some of them are visiting your neighbors. So really knowing that all your animals are where they're supposed to be is very important. We really encourage you to work with a veterinarian. And if you don't have a sheep or goat vet in your area, please contact the American Association of Small Ruminant Practitioners. These are veterinarians that work specifically with sheep and goats. And if you do have a vet that works with you, I would encourage you to get them connected with this association as they can be a good source of information and technical support for your vet as they help you deal with your problems that come up with your herd. And one of the problems, as we mentioned, that may come up and that you need a veterinarian to help you with is internal parasite infection. You see the goat in this picture is suffering from internal parasites. Um, look at the way he's standing, the way his head is, her head is low, her tail is down. That's not normal on a goat. If their tail is down like that, they don't feel well. Notice that the legs are tucked up under the body and it kind of has a hunched stance. This animal is also very, very thin. You can see the bones. And notice that the hair coat is kind of rough. You see um, a patchiness. It's in contrast, look at some of the other slides we'll show you with healthy goats. You'll see a shiny, smooth coat. So this animal definitely not feeling well. And in my mind, if you're in a humid area, if you have an animal that's below par, internal parasites is the first thing you check for. You've got to learn more about internal parasites before you get your sheep or goats. And these publications can help, the ones listed from our website. And also go to the Southern Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control website listed here. This is a group of researchers and extensionists that work extensively on this problem. There is a lot of resistance to anthelmintics. That is, the worms have developed resistance to anthelmintics. And it's causing internal parasites to be more of a problem than they were, say, 20 years ago. So it's very important that you learn about this and learn to recognize the signs and some effective ways of managing, including, uh, I would say, pasture management being very key. Since we're talking about keeping animals healthy, we really need to talk a little bit about feeding them. As I mentioned, good nutrition is the basis for keeping your animals healthy. Sheep and goats are ruminants, and so they need forage. And this is really a great thing about sheep or goats, is that they're able to be raised primarily on forages and don't require supplemental feed. Though you do, there will be times that hay and other supplements may be necessary. It's really important to manage your pastures and your forages well. Keep them in a good productive state and don't let the animals overgraze them and kill out their favorite feed. Another great thing about sheep and goats and how they're able to be raised on forages is their ability to make the most of the nutrition available to them. You probably have an image of an old billy goat eating a tin can. And this really isn't a correct depiction because it makes you think that goats can just survive off anything and don't really need nutritious feed. And that's not the case. Sheep and goats do require nutritious, high-quality feed, but they're able to select the most nutritious parts of a plant. So if they're provided with a diverse diet, a lot of selection, they can choose what is the best diet for them and really select the most nutritious part of the plant. And as Margot said, they are selective grazers. This graphic is to explain some of the preferences, the grazing preferences that the various animals have. If they're given the opportunity to select what they want, goats will tend to select mostly browse, which is brush or woody plants. Sheep will tend to select mostly forbs, which are broadleafed weeds, and cattle will select mostly grass. So if you have a farm with all of these types of vegetation, it would be to your advantage to graze two or even three species of animals so that you can make better use of that vegetation and keep your composition stable. If you don't do that, if you only run cattle, for instance, you will see that the grass gets eaten and the weeds and the brush kind of get out of control and that requires you to spend money controlling it. Whereas if brush tends to be a problem on your farm, if you would just add some goats to your farm, like one goat per cow, they can control that brush for no cost. 
and the cattle don't miss that feed because they weren't going to eat it anyway. In the same way, if weeds is more of a problem, leafy spurge or some other weed, then you could add sheep to your farm and get more pounds of meat marketed off the same land, better income off the same land. Some studies have shown that adding sheep to cattle gets you a 25% better income off the same land, free brush and weed control, and incidentally, better health for your sheep or goats because cattle don't share parasites with sheep and goats. Goats and sheep do share with each other. Cattle are a dead-end host for the internal parasite larva of sheep or of goats, so they kind of help clean the pasture off and make it safer for your sheep and goats. There are a lot of different advantages to multi-species grazing. I really encourage you to think about that if, if that might fit on your farm. Another benefit of sheep and goats and raising them on pasture is that they don't require a lot of extensive shelter and equipment. Now I did mention fencing, which as I mentioned, you will have to pay attention to and you will have to invest in good fencing and please do it before you bring sheep and goats to your farm. It's <laughs> no fun to have to constantly try to get the sheep and goats back to where you want them to be. But they don't require a lot of shelter. Really, they just need an area so that they can be protected from cold wind, rain, and also a place to get some shade. You see sheep bedded down here in a grove of trees. In a temperate climate, trees are adequate shelter, and you may not need much more than this. You can see this hoop shelter is a really great low-cost method. It's just some cattle panels hooped up with a tarp stretched tightly over it. This provides a place for animals to get out of the rain, the wind. They may choose to kid or lamb in there. And it's portable. You can move these shelters to different pastures or um, get them out of a way if it's getting too worn down or it's getting dirty. Now, this shelter works great if you're in my climate here in northwest Arkansas. But if you're in Minnesota, this probably won't cut it in the middle of the winter. So if you're in an area with very extreme weather, a lot of snow, inclement weather, then you will need some more extensive barns. This is another good place where you can visit with other producers in your area and see what types of barns and shelters they have and see what might work on your farm. And while you're on that farm, look and see what kind of handling equipment they have. One of the things that, that I really like about sheep and goats is you don't need a lot of handling equipment. On our farm basically we have a small pen to catch animals. How you use that is you crowd as many animals as will fit into that small pen. They are herd animals, flock animals, and they're more uh, comfortable, less stressed when they're with each other, so that helps calm them down, but also it makes it where they can't run, which helps calm me down. You can catch an animal easily and do what you need to do with it. If you have to bring it out in the open, do that, but we do a lot of deworming or vaccinating. Just by crowding them in a pen, do what you need to do, mark them with a paint stick, and, and then let the whole group out at once. That's a must. It's nice if you have a scale. Uh, good to know the mature weight of your animals because that's important for dosing of dewormers, of uh, s several other kinds of medications. You really need to know the weight. And if you're direct marketing a slaughter stock, it's very helpful to know exactly what you've got. If you can't afford to buy a scale and they are pricey, you might be able to borrow one or rent one from your local extension or an FFA chapter. So check into that. If you're going to have a lot of animals, it's very useful to have a working chute and sorting gates. You see two different setups here. The one on the left, a really nice commercial setup, very easy to move, um, expensive, but if you have a large herd, it could sure be worth it. On the right, you see one built by Mr. Walt Davis in Oklahoma. Very, very workable and very cheap. If you have welding skills or know someone who does, you might investigate making a facility like that. It's perfectly adequate and saves a lot of money. All right. Well, we've spent a little time just touching on a few production issues, but now we're going to spend a little more time discussing marketing. Marketing is a really important topic that often gets overlooked, so that's why we're going to spend just a few moments on it. Marketing is what sets your farm apart and can determine if you're profitable or not. We've talked a little bit about some of the challenges. I lost you. 
Um, we talked a little bit about some of the challenges. Can you hear me? And um, now we're going to talk about other marketing methods. Go ahead, Margo. Okay. okay. Some things to consider when thinking about marketing and getting started and determining how you will market your animals. Think about what's available in your area, your local demand and local access to processing or sale barns, things like that. Your personal preference and your farm goals. What are you willing to spend time on? There's a lot of different options, and we're going to touch on a few of these, but just keep some of these things in mind, that different options are going to take different amounts of time and different investments, but they may pay off or they may not. So we're going to talk about some of these marketing options, and up front, let's say this, you need to keep good records. That's not just important for the IRS, but it's important for you in making decisions and evaluating which options are working for you and which are more hassle than they're worth. So good record keeping is fundamental and also learning what your customers want and then continually working to meet that demand. Satisfied customers are return customers and that is really what you need. So we're going to imagine that this is our flock of sheep, this is your flock of sheep, and you need to think of options to market one of these lambs. Let's say that these lambs weigh about 100 pounds. We're going to run through some different scenarios and consider the benefits and also the challenges of each kind of marketing option for these lambs. The first scenario we'll go through is the sale barn. This is kind of the tried and true method of marketing livestock. The great thing about a sale barn is it doesn't take a lot of effort. You can load up a large amount of animals, haul them to the sale barn, drop them off, and next week get your paycheck. However, the bad thing is, is you never know how large or small that check may be because you're not guaranteed a price. Some nights you might have a really good day at the sale barn and sometimes not. It depends on how many buyers and what type of buyers show up and also how many animals are there. You will also have to pay some fees, commission, yardage fees or the fee they charge you to hold your animals and other fees such as a tagging fee. And also you'll have some shrink to your animals. If you load up a hundred pound animal at your farm, by the time it travels to the sale barn, waits in a holding pen, and goes through the sale ring, it will have lost some weight. So for our example, we're taking that 100-pound lamb, and we actually had a pretty decent night at the sale barn and got 90 cents a pound, so that will give us $90. But remember, we have to pay those fees and commission, so we're probably only going to bring home about 80 or $82. So there's another way that you can sell your lambs that's very time efficient because you can sell a large lot, but it's less risky than the sale barn because in these examples, you know the price ahead of time and you can decide whether or not that is sufficient for you and choose not to participate if it's not. Some of these sales include pooled and graded sales and the premise of these is a large lot of uniform animals will bring a better price and they can be trucked across the country to a better market and so if you can work together in a group in a in a region to gather up a large lot of uniform animals that can be very advantageous for all of you there are still going to be some fees to pay and some other charges such as some trucking but you know ahead of time what the price is going to be in many cases in a graded sale, also it's graded by a USDA grader who then, you know the price ahead of time. This grade is going to get this price, this grade is going to get another, and you're going to get paid for quality, which is, which is nice. The thing to remember about these sales is you've got to meet the criteria of the buyers of the sales. So if your buyer says, I want 60 to 80 pound meat goat kids, 
and you come to the sale with a truckload of 40 pound bony dairy goat kids, the buyer's not going to be happy and can choose not to take those animals, will choose probably not to take those animals. So be sure you meet the criteria and recognize that these are organized sales. They require cooperation with other growers, which I think is a good thing. They may or may not be available in your area, but certainly a good efficient option for selling large lots with less risk. Now we're going to spend a little time talking about some different direct marketing options where you're dealing directly with your customer. If you like to interact with customers, then these options may be a better fit with you. But if you would prefer to not have to deal with anybody, then a sale barn might be a better fit for your operation. There, the benefits of direct marketing is you get to set your price. We'll talk a little bit right now about on-farm sales. One thing to think about if you're going to allow people to come to your farm to purchase animals is it's very time consuming. You'll have to spend time separating out animals that you're interested in selling, arranging a time for a buyer to come to your farm, and sometimes they might not show up when you've arranged a time or sometimes they might show up when you haven't arranged a time. So just remember those things. Many times buyers who are interested in on-farm sales are also interested in on-farm slaughter for ethnic or religious reasons. If this is something that you feel comfortable doing, it can be a great service you can provide and it can also warrant a higher price for the animal. Now please be aware that on-farm slaughter is not legal in all states or in all areas, so definitely check your local regulations. If you are going to allow on-farm slaughter, you'll need to have liability insurance in case anything should go wrong. And also you'll have to deal with the guts and the hides, things like that, so please be aware of that. You can see this photo is just a very simple setup to allow someone to do on-farm slaughter, and that can work quite well. Other benefits are of on-farm sales is you're not having that shrink in weight in um, travel. You don't have transport cost or commission or other fees. So those are all good things. Another option if on-farm slaughter isn't legal in your area or you're not comfortable doing that is you can sell a live animal to a customer, deliver it to a custom processor, and then have the customer deal with the processor for their cuts and then they would pick up their own meat. This can be a good option if your customers are willing to do that and feel comfortable dealing with a processor. For our example here, we've said our on-farm sale, we set the price at $1.50 a pound, which is very reasonable. If you've provided any of these other services that I've discussed, on-farm slaughter or you've delivered it to a processor, you could probably charge more. As Margot said, some customers might not be comfortable going to the custom processing plant to pick up the meat. So you can add another level of service by working with a boxed lamb or, or a, a buyer's club, a meat CSA, some other kind of option for selling customers a whole lamb or a half lamb. First trick is to find that market, uh, but if you find them and keep your customers happy, they can just grow word of mouth. The business can grow quite quickly, and you can find your market, by the way, by listing your farm on Local Harvest or other websites. There are many options there. The trick for this business is you must have a processor. Custom processor for this won't work because that one requires the customer to pick up the meat and then this one you're going to pick it up and deliver it so you need a state inspected facility or a USDA inspected facility those are not available uh, not readily available in every area so check that out but if you do have that option and you can have a good quality animal you can really build a good business and because you're doing these extra services you certainly can charge more than this we have put a really conservative $3 a pound live weight on this 100 pound lamb, bringing us in $300. But we have to pay for the processing, and that can be quite substantial. The cheapest I've seen was about $40, but I think $75 to $100 is much more realistic and more likely to be a, a price that you see. There are also quite a bit of logistics to work out here with, uh, with scheduling the processing, picking up delivering all of that and working with your buyers so it takes some organization on your part 
this can be a very good way to build a good business and very satisfying to work directly with customers who give you good feedback about your products. You can also market your meat to a restaurant or a store. Now this also takes quite a bit of effort as you'll have to visit with chefs, probably give them some samples, and it also requires a consistent supply and quality. A restaurant may want to keep lamb on the menu all year long, and so you would have to work with your production in order to meet that supply and also have a consistent quality so that a chef knows that they're getting a high-quality product every single time. Once again, this will require a state or federally inspected processing facility. And really a downfall of marketing to a restaurant is a chef probably won't want a whole or a half animal. Whereas with the boxed lamb, you're getting rid of the whole animal and you don't have to deal with selling individual cuts. So you'll have to have another market to get rid of some of these cuts if a, if a restaurant isn't interested in a whole or half animal. For our situation here, we've said those 100 pound lambs yielded 38 pounds of meat and we sold it for an average of $5.50 a pound, which is pretty conservative. And so that gives us $209 from that lamb. But once again, remember your processing costs, which Linda touched on earlier. So we just ran through a few options for selling lamb and there are a lot more options for selling products from your sheep or your goats. Value-added meat products such as uh, lamb sausage or a jerky, something like that could be a very good option. Selling breeding stock would be another way to go and that's got many advantages. Uh, for there I think the key is they should be good quality stock and always, always healthy. Again, satisfied customers and word of mouth its what you need. Show stock is another way to go. 4-H uh, and FFA members, particularly meat goat projects, have become very popular. And on the county level, you might just sell a few of your animals this way, but that can help increase the profitability of your enterprise. Vegetation management is something that we have mentioned a couple times and we will again because this is a place where sheep and goats really shine. They can be used as uh, leafy spurge control or kudzu or many other options. You can maybe rent those to a neighbor to control brush and we'll talk later about a great resource to give you more information on how you might use your animals for this business. Fleece can be a good option. I know a, a Louisiana producer that we bought sheep from who was making quite good money by direct marketing fleece and they were selling every fleece from their hundred use. Very creative, it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, but they really were doing a great job with that. Milk and dairy products are another good option. Here it's crucial that you know your regulations and milk and dairy products if you're going the value added route takes skill and time and training. But cheese uh, maybe even soap or lotion, something that's not edible, can be great options. The thing to remember is you're not locked into doing all of one or all of the other. So if you think back about our lambs, you might sell some lambs direct as box lamb, you might sell some of them right off your farm, you might take a few to the sale barn, and that's good. It's better to not be reliant on any one buyer. So I encourage you, if you're doing sheep and goats, to sell as many products as you can and to do as many avenues as is feasible for your farm and with your goals. And we've mentioned a few prices here, which we have based off of real data. But you may be wondering, how do I know what to charge for my animals? Now, if you're taking them to a sale barn, you're getting what you're getting. And one of those pooled sales, you pretty much know what the price is set at. But for all the other options, and as Linda just mentioned, there are so many other options that could be a possibility for your farm. You will have to determine your own price. Now this is variable and prices can vary from location to location. Some markets will bear a higher price and some areas just won't. And it also depends on the product. A product that has more value added to it, maybe you've taken your fleece and made it into yarn, that yarn can yield a higher price than just a raw fleece. 
the main thing I want to stress here is when setting your price is you need to cover your cost. And this is where record keeping really comes in. You need to know what it costs to produce that product. So first and foremost, cover your cost and then build in some profit. How much profit you build in also varies. Once again, it goes back to what your market will bear. It may go back to your farm goals and what you need from these animals. Do you have sheep and goats just for a little bit of extra income or your sheep and goat operation your main source of income? That may determine how much profit you need to build in. So really you can see all of these components work together and um, to help you set your price. You can also look at what other local producers are charging to help you get a basis, but please remember you have to cover your cost. And in thinking about covering your costs, we've included this chart to help you think through the uh, ramifications of keeping your costs low and your profitability, or your productivity high. Across the top bar, we see percent lamb crop, which is how many lambs do you sell per you? And a 200% lamb crop, for instance, means they all had twins. Down the side, we see U cost, which is the cost to maintain a U per year, $30 up down to 60. And let's suppose for this example that you have a very productive flock, 200% lamb crop for sale this year, and you were able to keep your costs very low by using forages, and you didn't have any health issues, so no, no real big health costs. So for $30 a year at a 200% lamb crop, you can see that the break-even price for your 100-pound lamb is 15 cents a pound. So there's lots of room for profit in this enterprise. But let's suppose you have a predation problem that you were not able to get control of quickly, and this year you're only selling a 75% lamb crop. That is less than one lamb per ewe. And also it was a drought year, you had to buy hay, you had to buy supplemental grain, and your U cost is $60 this year. Now your break-even price for that 100-pound lamb is $0.80 cents a pound. And you can see that selling them at that sale barn where you were bringing home maybe $0.82 or $0.83 cents is not going to cut it. Just think through how to keep your costs low, using lots of forages and keeping them healthy. Keep your productivity high for the best chance of success with your enterprise. That's right. Just to reiterate this point, to enhance profitability, so to be as profitable as possible, you do need to keep costs low, use forages extensively, and manage your forages to keep them productive, keep animals healthy, keep good records so you know those animals that are producing well and those are the ones you want to keep. Or you also can recognize the animals that have had health problems or those that haven't um, reproduce, haven't weaned ki kids or lambs, those are the animals you need to cull because they are costing you money. So do those things to help keep your costs low and your herd and flock productive. And then once again, pay attention to marketing. As we've mentioned, we've just touched on just a few options. There really can be many, many more options. And the great thing is, is there are lots of options and you can use a combination to really work with your farm and the strengths that you have to make your farm, your operation as profitable as possible. So wrapping up now, I hope that you've caught some of our enthusiasm for sheep and goats because they do offer so many advantages and maybe they can help your farm as they have ours. They have multiple products that can be marketed in multiple ways. They help improve your lamb, your land and diversify your income. They have a quick return on investment and they're very attractive and appealing to farm visitors. They're adaptable to so many different farm situations and they complement other enterprises such as cattle or horses, or pasture poultry or vegetables or orchards. So really encourage you to think through what your farm can do and how sheep and goats might help for you to meet your goals. Thanks for joining us today. We have right and we we realize that we haven't had a lot of time to touch on really much of anything. So we really encourage you to get more information and here are a few resources to help you do so. Here's the actual website once again. You can also call us on our toll free number to order any of the publications that we've mentioned or to ask us a question. The Maryland Small Ruminant page has extensive information on sheep and goat production, everything from 
reproduction to marketing, lots of different information. For information specific to sheep and goat marketing, including a producer directory, visit sheepgoatmarketing.info. Langston University in Oklahoma has done extensive education and research on both dairy and meat goat production. They have some really nice educational materials, including an online meat goat course and a nutrition calculator to help you determine rations. And if you're interested in vegetation management that we've talked a little bit about, please see this targeted grazing handbook. It has extensive information on using sheep and goats to manage different vegetation and noxious weeds, multi-species grazing, and also information if you're interested in becoming a vegetation management provider. If selling meat is what you'd like to do with your animals, please check out the Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network. They include a lot of information we didn't have time to touch on, including in a webinar about labeling, and they have a contact person available in every state who can help walk you through some of the issues you need to cover and also help you find a local processor. Marketing Out of the Mainstream is an ASI publication. It's an old one, but it's available as a PDF on the website at sheepusa.org. Uh, it's so old it doesn't mention the internet, but it has great information that will be helpful to you if you're going to market meat. It has some useful charts showing how the, the cuts might break out for your carcass and can help with pricing information and many other things you need to know. So I encourage you to check that out if you're going to sell meat. Again, contact your local extension. They really are very valuable sources of information. They've got written materials, they have conferences and workshops, and maybe most importantly, they can help you to find local producer groups or associations. I encourage you to get involved with them. I really believe farmers need to cooperate more with each other, and that can make the pooled sale and other beneficial arrangements more possible. And then if there's anything we can do for you, we'd like you to contact us. Our number is listed here, 800-346-9140, or you can email us. So thanks again for listening today. Back to you, Jeff. Thank you, Margo and Linda, for this great presentation on sheep and goats. Um, a reminder to our listeners and audience that this entire webinar, the slides and the audio, will be available on the ATRA website within a couple of days. So if you missed anything um, or wanted to go back and review a chart or a table or some information, just go to our ATRA website. That's ATRA, A-T-T-R-A, dot N-C-A-T, dot O-R-G. And we'll have the webinar available for there for you to download and view at your, at your leisure. We have had over 500 people listen into the uh, webinar today, which is a wonderful number. And we've also had a lot of big questions being asked online. Um, I've been looking at the questions as Linda and Margo have done their presentation. And we'll spend a few minutes now asking Linda and Margo some of the questions that came in during the last hour. Um, we'll probably go for another 10 minutes or so, maybe a little past the top of the hour, asking questions. So feel free to join us and listen in on those questions if you can sp spare the time. Uh, Linda and Margo, one of the first questions I had dealt with how do, you, um, how do you stock different pastures? How do you determine your stocking issues with sheep and goats and determine when you're overgrazing or have too many animals on the, on the land? Uh, Jeff, that is a great question and really common question and it's hard to answer because farms are so variable even in a very small geog geographical region. I think my farm would support more sheep than Margot's will because of topography and, and the different vegetation. Um, but you can look at it, start at it from how many cattle can be supported in the area. And local producers or extension people can can help you with that. And then I, I think I figure five sheep is equivalent about to a cow, depending on maybe for hair sheep you could go six. And in, it really also depends on the vegetation. In a brushy area, you could stock more goats than you could cow. You could say even eight or nine goats depending on your goals. Do you want to kill the brush or do you want to use it? Uh, so it's very variable and then whatever you start with you've got to monitor because overgrazing anything below say four inches is overgrazing. It's detrimental to your pasture, it's detrimental to your animals, it's detrimental to your soil. It can lead them more open to internal parasite infection and it, you just don't want to do it. 
And for sheep particularly, that's hard to control because their urge is to go right down to the ground, you know, right down to the ground. They'll make it look like a pool table if you don't control by rotational grazing or by any way frequent moving. Uh, so you asked about stocking, and I would say too, I'd start lower than you think it can support because they multiply, hmm. because they grow, and because it's a lot better to have too few animals on the land than too many for health reasons of the land and of the animals. Does that, yeah. Is that a fair mark? Okay. What about, uh, we had a couple of listeners ask a question about raising sheep and goats together and any specific management issues of, of having them both in the same pasture and even adding poultry to the mix. What, what do you have to keep in mind managing the different species as a, as a group in the same pasture? Well, you can definitely raise sheep and goats together. Both Linda and I do that. Once again, thinking back to that chart about preferences, if you have some brushy areas or some weeds, mm -hmm. they really do complement each other. As we mentioned, they do share the same parasites. So just think about you have, you know, all the animals are contributing to the parasite load and they can, they're all susceptible to those parasites. So that, that is something you have to think about with sheep and goats. Um, a good way to manage that if you are raising them together is if you're rotating your pastures, let the younger, more susceptible animals go through first, get a higher quality feed, and there's less parasite infestation on the pasture, and then let your older animals go through. Many people are successful using pastured poultry and sheep and goats together as well. You can, um, you know, run the sheep through. They eat the pastures down. You can move the, the poultry in or have them there together. The poultry do break that parasite cycle somewhat in their foraging and um, moving around and disturbing the, the fecal matter. One thing you'll have to think about, though, is if you do have pastured poultry pens, um, if it's anything low with a tarp or anything like that, sheep and goats will get on those. And so um, if you are going to have them in the same area together, you'll have to definitely deal with that. Um, you know, you don't want your goats jumping on top of the, the poultry pen and ripping it to shreds, which they, is very possible. Well, that, that's right, Margo, and I would just like to add about the minerals being the, the problem with running sheep and goats together in that sheep cannot tolerate as much copper as goats can, and goats really need a little more copper in my mind. I think they do. So the, the mineral supplementation can be a problem with multi-species grazing. Uh, if they're run with cattle, goats can use a cattle mineral. We, we do that, and that's just fine, but sheep... If the, if the cattle mineral is very high in copper, the sheep can get in some trouble. So that is, uh, that is a concern. And one way to get around it is, oh, with our dairy goats, it's pretty easy because we can supplement them while we're milking. But you can use a, a copper bolus, perhaps, to supplement that and then just feed a sheep mineral. But that is one concern you have to monitor. And I would consult your local veterinarian and your local extension people because each area is so different in mineral status. How about the, the personalities of these different species? Do you have to deal with cantankerous goats and turf wars between the poultry and the sheep, or do they just tend to <laughs> work it out amongst themselves? I wish I had film of some fights between the rams and the bucks. Those were, those were quite, uh, <laughs> quite dramatic, but we run, we run the sheep and goats together. They do have some things to work out, but that, that's what they do. I mean, a little headbutting goes on sometimes, but they really coexist very peacefully. As far as personalities go, if you run them both, they are different. Sheep are different from goats. And that's one of the things Margo was getting at when she said, visit other people's farms and see which animals you really like. Because some people mm -hmm. are goat people and some are not. So <laughs> That's right. And you'll, you'll probably see more behavior variation within, you know, your flock of sheep or your herd of goats. Um, there will be, you know, we have a bossy goat and... She's, she's the leader, um, and so you, you will see those behavior issues within any herd or flock. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good. And while we're talking about behavior, though, I should say, uh, I've stressed that these are very child-friendly enterprises, and they are, but the ram or the buck is the exception to that. We've got gentle ones, and I'm not worried about them, but I still keep a cautious eye out during breeding season because they can become territorial and you just don't turn your back on the male. Hmm. 
speaking of a uh, gentleness, we did have a question about uh, a value-added market for for petting zoos or baby doll sheep or using mm -hmm. thinking about that as a, as an enterprise. Have you seen exa examples of that being successful? Oh yes, definitely. I mean, you cannot go to a petting petting zoo, petting farm without seeing sheep or goats because they are small, they are very cute, they are very friendly and curious animals and so they do very well. Um, so definitely people can have an option to, to have them. As, as Linda has mentioned, they are very good draw for visitors, very attractive. And there are some breeds that you mentioned, the baby doll sheep, which we've seen examples of them being used in orchards in California because of their small size. They don't pose as much threat to um, some of the orchard plants. So definitely use the small size to your advantage. And if you can have, if you have a market charging people to come see your cute sheep and goats, do it. Good. Speaking of uh, adding value, one of our uh, listeners today owns a ranch in central Montana and mentioned that they have five to six hundred goats that eat leafy spurge very successfully. Um, and I know in Missoula, Montana, where I live, the city itself owns a herd of 300 sheep or so that graze leafy spurge on the city parkland surrounding the valleys. Um, we did have a question about what can you charge per day for leasing to a client for grazing or other examples perhaps you've seen of, of this is a value-added market as well? I, the, this is Linda. I would refer the listener to the targeted grazing manual which goes into some of that. Uh, I've seen fees of a dollar per animal per day but I don't know that you could charge that everywhere. Um, but that targeted grazing manual has chapters written for providers to help them think through issues and include some budget information. Another place to go for information like that would be Livestock for Landscapes. Uh, the, uh, hmm. uh, the person is Kathy Voth, V-O-T-H, Livestock for Landscapes. And she has some information on her website and also some uh, DVDs or CDs that you can buy and she includes budget information and sample contracts. Was there anything else? Right. We've seen variable costs yes. depending on location, what they're mm -hmm. being used for, how many animals, how short or long of a time the contract is for. So that's another thing that's very variable. Right. There, there's a provider network on Livestock for Landscapes. I think ASI site also has a provider network and I think sheepgoatmarketing.info has a list of providers as well. Uh, so there are lots of places to get information and uh, we can help more with that too. But definitely the targeted grazing handbooks, the first place I would go. Great, good. One question too about um, processing. We talked about different methods of processing, but could you give an overview of the differences between custom processing and state and federal regulations and even organic processing? Sure. This is Margo. Custom processing you may be familiar with. Those are the processors in your area that probably process deer during hunting season. A custom processor, the meat process there cannot be sold. It will be marked not for sale. It's for individual use. So like we mentioned, you can sell a live animal to a customer and then you can drop the animal off at the processor but the customer has to deal with the processor and then pick up their meat. A state inspected facility, um, if you have state inspection in your state, which only about half of the states have a state inspection program, that meat can be processed and then sold within your state. Now, there, there is some upcoming legislation that might allow that to be sold across state lines, but right now it's just within the state. So, so that, that obviously broadens your ability to market. And then a USDA or federally inspected plant, that meat can be sold anywhere, shipped across state lines. Um, so obviously if you have access to a USDA processing facility, it will really help broaden your marketing options. You, miss, you mentioned an organic processor. If you are interested in organic production, Finding an organic processor may be very challenging. It's already challenging enough to find a conventional processor, um, 
but finding one that is certified organic or is willing to work with you to become certified organic may be an additional challenge. But once again, the inspection levels would be the same, but um, adding an organic certification would be the difference for organic meat. And presumably, you, you can contact your local, your state uh, certification agencies to see who is qualified to to work with that in your states, I presume. Right, and also visit that Niche Meat Processor Assistant ne Network. Um, the website mm -hmm. listed there, they have contacts in each state that can help you locate processing. Um, state Departments of Ag, your local extension, all those people can help you um, find processing in your area. We had a, a couple of listeners ask about kosher processing too, and I presume that it's similarly challenging sometimes to find kosher uh, certifiers for processing of sheep and goats. Yes, and that would be very location dependent. I would um, imagine it's much easier to find the kosher processing if you're in an area that has that population. So the Northeast, probably in the West Coast. Um, here in the Mid-South and Arkansas, I'm not really familiar with many kosher processors, so it would be an, any type of kosher, halal, any of those additional things that go on top of just regular processing will add to the difficulty of finding a processor. But definitely check around and um, you, you may find some luck, you may have some luck finding a processor. Good, good. I think we'll take a couple more questions and then we'll uh, wrap it up. Unfortunately, we've We've had close to 150 questions asked during this presentation, and I wish we could get to them all. Um, just a reminder, if we don't get to your question today, feel free to call our toll-free hotline on the ATRA website, um, atra.ncat.org, and also look through the wonderful publications, many of which Margo and Linda themselves have written for ATRA that are on the website that deal with, with uh, lamb and, and sheep and goats and marketing and processing. So a lot of information we talk about today is available in those publications on our ATRA website. I um, had a question about uh, goats. We talked about goats picking up down fruit. Um, are there concerns, though, about goats destroying the orchard trees themselves when you let them loose into the orchard to clean up the fruit? Yes, and sheep and sheep as well. We had sheep in our, on our farm in Kansas, and they, in the wintertime, would girdle the trees. I mean, they'd strip the bark. So you definitely, if you're using sheep or goats in an orchard setting, you've got to monitor. I feel like you've got to protect the trees. And, but mm -hmm. for sure, monitor. I've had people tell me that they've had sheep in orchards and they've never bothered them. So good, they're lucky. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't, a goat's favorite food probably is a good fruit tree. And you just don't want to <laughs> jeopardize, your, um, jeopardize your investment there. But to use them with, say, some electric fencing protecting the trees, remembering that goats have quite a reach. They get up on their hind legs and they go six feet high. So a good fence to protect the trees, I think sheep probably are better than goats to run in an orchard because the grassy cover that you're going to see in an orchard would be more more what sheep would like. Um, mm -hmm. good. But yeah, I would, I would watch your trees. <laughs> what about um, supplements in terms of micronutrients or vitamins for sheep or goat herds? Do you, how, how do you deal with determining what's, what's needed to, uh, if, if anything, to uh, keep them healthy? Well, that's definitely location dependent. Check with your local veterinarian, your local extension, because different areas have different soil mineral contents, forage mineral and vitamin contents. So that's something that is quite variable. Some areas may be deficient in a certain vitamin or mineral, and that would require additional supplementation. Some areas are high in other minerals or vitamins. So definitely it's a local thing, but providing a loose mineral mix is is needed with your sheep and goats. You really need to always have fresh mineral available and really in a loose form is better for sheep and goats. And as Linda mentioned, sheep are much more um, susceptible to copper toxicity. So you do have to be aware of that in, in dealing with mineral supplementation. Consult a nutritionist, Excellent. you know, consult okay. a nutritionist and then if you're using a mineral, you also have to track consumption. You know, if they're not, you know, it, the mineral mix might have what it needs, but if they're not eating it, then it's not doing the animals any good. So it, there is some trial and error involved in this as well, I think. But do be, mm -hmm. I think 
that's right, very location specific. And, and vitamins and minerals are very, very important. You can, they definitely, deficiencies, and even, as I mentioned, toxicities definitely cause health problems, and you will notice production challenges if they're deficient in minerals. Well, another thing I would say is, I don't worry about vitamins, but providing them a diverse diet of forages, I mean, more than one kind of forage, will really help their status health-wise. Mm -hmm. I would presume, too, too, if you can find a mentor or an established sheep and yeah, goat exactly. uh, rancher that lead on his or her experience in your, in your world. Absolutely. Maybe one more question to both of you to sort of wrap up and then we'll uh, end the, the webinar is, is what have you seen over the last few years in terms of profits and prices and do you feel it's, it's more challenging in this day and age to, to succeed with raising sheep and goats or are the opportunities more vibrant and you actually can find better niches that didn't even exist a decade ago or what's your overall opinion of the future of the sheep and goat market world here for small farmers? If we can keep people raising sheep and goats so that we don't lose any more infrastructure, then I feel really good about it. They, they can be raised on forage, which protects us against grain prices. And mm -hmm. they can be marketed direct, which means the, the local food, um, the interest we have in local food is great for sheep and goat producers because they can be marketed locally and direct marketed to people. Uh, prices have been stable. The demand is good. I think there is plenty of plenty of opportunity for sheep and goat producers. One problem that I am worried about is the uh, lack of processing plants available and I think I'm concerned about increasing regulation that makes life more difficult for those plants to succeed. So I would say if you're in an area you have a good processor, treat them well and <laughs> appreciate them because they are a vital link if you're going to be selling meat direct to the customer. Margo, you have yeah, I just want to add, and we touched on earlier, sheep and goats offer so many different types of products and really, I mean, endless possibilities. So that is a definite benefit to marketing sheep and goats is that you're not just locked into a commodity market. You're, you know, you don't just have to sell meat. You have many other options to help diversify the income opportunities for your farm. Right, and I think the targeted grazing thing is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger because there's such a need for it. The noxious weeds are a huge problem really all over the country. The weeds are different, but the problem is the same, and we need more sheep and goats grazing. So Good. So more sheep and goats. Yeah. Let's get, get out there and <laughs> keep busy. Uh, I think we'll wrap it up there. Margo and Linda, thank you so much, and I know we've had such a great attendance too. A reminder to everyone that this webinar will be archived on our ATRA website at atra.nncat.org and you can listen to it then and feel free again to call our toll-free hotline or email Margaret Linda with more questions and thanks for a great uh, webinar. Um, we will be having more webinars during the year through our ATRA program funded with funding from USDA and if you are on this webinar you got an invitation and we'll, we'll be certain to send you invitations to our other webinars and events during the year. Thanks again for attending the webinar. On behalf of NCAT and ATRA, this is Jeff Berkby thanking you for being part of our sheep and goat uh, colloquium today. Goodbye.